Good afternoon, everyone, and um, a very um, warm Thursday afternoon to you all. Um, thank you so much for joining our Thursday lunchtime lecture day. Apologies that we're running a couple of minutes behind. Um, I was just setting up some links um, for today's lecture. Um, so thank you everyone for bearing with us. Um, as is always the custom with these lectures, the first 10 minutes of these lectures we dedicate to Church Three, which is where we explore one of the 356 historic churches in our care at the Trust, which in some ways has a connection to today's lecture. Now, I'm really excited today to be passing you, um, not to Peter, who I'm normally excited to pass you to, but to um, my manager, Shana James, who's stepping in for Peter to do Church of the Week. So Shana, I'm gonna hand over to you now for Church of the Week. Thanks, George. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm now going to share my screen and George will tell me if I've shared the right one. One moment, please. Is that, are you seeing that, George? <laughs> share. One moment, sorry. My mouse isn't, isn't behaving. Right. How's that, George? I'm just going to do um, full screen for the PowerPoint. So as you'll have seen, this week's Church of the Week is, is that okay, George? St. Mary at the Quay, Ipswich in Suffolk. As always, I'd like to start by thanking Ecclesiastical Insurance for sponsoring Church of the Week and their continued support of our lunchtime lectures. So this church is one that I've visited um, personally on many occasions and I've seen its transformation over the years um, and I'll talk about the regeneration work shortly. Um, this medieval church lies next to Ipswich's regenerated quayside. It was built um, or perhaps rebuilt between 1450 and 1550 um, and you can see these elegant perpendicular windows bathe the interior and its handsome arcades with light and you can see on the right hand side of the church there is the modern extension, which was part of the regeneration work, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So in the Middle Ages, Ipswich was a bustling medieval port. Like its regional football rival Norwich, Ipswich had many medieval churches. It's possible that before the Reformation, the dedication of this church was Sancta Maria Stella Mari, Our Lady Star of the Sea. Being a port town meant that Ipswich had many wealthy merchants and was influenced by other European cultures. One such merchant was Henry Tooley, who left us with one of the finest Tudor brass memorials in the county. Unlike many other brass memorials of the time, which have individual brass cut out figures, this memorial, which you see here, is made from one single, single rectangular sheet of brass. You can see a replica in the church as the original is on loan to the Ipswich Museum, or you can go to the Ipswich Museum and see the original. And during the regeneration and work of St Mary the Key, um, which I'll, as I'll talk about it shortly, our heritage, con heritage consultant spotted a strange feature embedded between the flints in the north wall of the church. It looked very much like the base of a bottle made from a sort of matte black glass. I'm going to leave you hanging there because you're going to learn a bit more about um, this today. Um, the, the subject of the today's lecture is concealed objects. So, um, but this is a concealed bottle um, and we'll learn a little bit more later on why such objects were hidden in buildings. So St Mary's is the longest church in Ipswich to have been redundant. There's a hymn called Don't Build Your House on the Sandy Land, while St Mary's is a case of Don't Build Your Church on Marshy Land. Several restorations over the centuries have tried to address the issues but have had little impact. So the pillars here, um, and this is from before the conservation work, are suffering from salt efflorescence. Now, what happened is um, concrete was used in the past um, in, in this church and that didn't that was on the floor and it didn't allow the floor to breathe. And what happened was um, from the water table, water came up through the columns, which were, um, I believe, limestone and porous. And when the, the salt water um, started to evaporate, the salt crystals formed and you can see these flakes here in in the pillars. So as part of the restoration and conservation, sorry, the conservation work, a slice was taken through the base of the pillars and some um, material put in so that this didn't happen. And of course, the, the concrete was taken up. So concrete is a big no-no for historic buildings because it doesn't um, allow it to breathe. Now in, um, oh, and this is St. Andrew's Walpole Norfolk, which is another church of ours. 
which um, has had salt efflorescence as well. And you can see the crumbling pillars, which we've, we've done some conservation work to address. In warm, wet weather, the vaults of St Mary's flooded and created a real stink. And this led to the vaults being emptied in 1980, sorry, emptied in 1989 to try and fix the issue. However, in 1943, the town was targeted by German air raids and bombs fell beside the church, which sealed its fate and led to its permanent closure. The bombs caused the foundations to weaken. And as you can see, the columns have blown out. So we needed to find a long-term solution to care for the church. And the answer was a multi-million pound regeneration project. Now here you can see the churchyard, which once joined onto the church. And I showed you earlier on the um, uh, extension, which is part of um, the work that we did um, to, to add new space to the church. So I just want to warn you, the next slide does show some human remains in the form of skeletons, which is part of the archeology span work that was carried out. So here is um, the archeologist at work. So they had to um, excavate the burials and they were reinterred on the site with a, a ceremony. Um, this pit here is the charnel pit. So this isn't caused by the archeologists um, when they excavated the remains. This is a historic feature. When new burials were put in the churchyard, old bones were put into a charnel pit. And here you can see an articulated skeleton. As I said, these remains were reinterred during a ceremony um, at the church later on. Here's another view of the courtyard, and we've used this building for many events, um, staff events. It was used by Suffolk Mind before the, the, the lockdown, and it's now being rented out um, as a space to River Church in Ipswich. So as I said, it's it's got a brilliant space inside. We've used this for staff events, and here you can see it for a conference. So that, everybody, is Church of the Week, and I'm going to hand back over to George. If I can manage to stop sharing. Thanks, Shana. And um, everyone, I've been to this church now a couple of times, and as Shana said, it's really um, an amazing space to go to. And I suppose, Shana, it goes to show, doesn't it, that conservation work that we've put in there, um, we saw that it, it, it's been closed. It wasn't used for regular um, worship. It's not that didn't really have a use at all after the Second World War when it suffered from bomb damage. And as a result of our intervention and conservation work, it not only um, has been open to the public, but now it's been returned to regular worship once again. Um, is it quite um, often a case like this where we have to make such heavy intervention work to a church, Shana? Well, this was um, at, came, came along at the right time. Suffolk Mines were looking for a venue and it was part of this project. We had funding from the, uh, the National Lottery Heritage Fund and it was in the, it's in the town centre. So there's much many more possibilities. It had the infrastructure around it to support the new use. Um, so we do have a number of regeneration projects. We have between two and three at any one time ongoing. Um, and this is just one of the successful ones. Well, they're all successful. This is one of the ones that has been completed and we can now uh, show off. But most of our churches aren't on this level. This is a, as I said, a regeneration project um, in a, as an urban church. And you showed some um, it, photos there of the archeological work um, that took place. How common is it that when we carry out work um, or, or, you know, indeed when we do maintenance um, to floors that we um, discover human remains? Is it something that we have um, policies in place to deal with? Yes, I mean, any work around the church um, has, be, has to be carefully considered and any kind of digging anywhere in the ground, you would have an archaeologist. Um, so this was quite a major project because we knew there were, I can't remember the number, but it was in the hundreds of burials um, that had to be, and it's quite it's quite common for that to happen. Um, not, not not necessarily at our churches, but if, if there's works and greatest care and um, consideration is taken, um, and great sensitivity, we had a, a special service and the bones were reinterred um, back at the church. So it was very interesting. They had open days; you could go along. We had schools there, um, looking at the archaeology. They found pottery, the ubiquitous ubiquitous clay pipes and um, pottery shards. So yeah, it was really, really interesting. Thanks, Shana. And um, yeah, um, that everyone was Church of the Week. So that was St. Mary at the Quay, Ipswich. Um, we've posted links if you'd like to learn more about it on our website, so do go and visit that. But everyone, a very happy Thursday to you all, and thank you for joining us for our Thursday lunchtime lecture today. Um, as is always the case, these lectures are completely free of charge. So if you see anybody commenting away with any links telling you to watch elsewhere, 
please don't click them and certainly please never give other people your credit card or financial details. These lectures are always free of charge. They're going to stay that way. And our recordings are also free of charge. And you can watch those recordings on our Facebook playlist um, or on our YouTube channel as well. Again, they're free of charge. Now, um, if you would like to support us um, and show your thanks um, for these free lectures, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can text donate. So you can text the word CCT to 70331, um, and that will give us a gift of three pounds. Alternatively, you can donate any amount you wish um, through our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk. Or finally, you can be one of the many people who have taken advantage of becoming a member with the Trust. Um, this is something that we've been promoting now for um, nearly a year, and we've got a special membership offer running. So if you join us by direct debit, so direct debit is from just £3.50 a month. Um, if you use um, direct debit, and if you use the offer code LECTURE, and that's the word LECTURE in capitals at checkout, you will get a free copy of this. Um, so this is the secret language of churches and cathedrals. This is a great companion to all of our lectures, not only just our past ones, but the ones I'm planning um, up um, into next year. You'll be very pleased that I've just secured um, four more lecturers today for 2022 lectures. So um, they're not going away anytime soon and the lectures are continuing. So um, this is a great companion to our lecture series. But as I said, if you join by a member from direct debit from just £3.50 a month, use the offer code lecture, you'll get a free copy of this. Um, today, we are also selling um, our lecturer's book. Um, I'm gonna pass you to Shana when she introduces Brian because I actually haven't got a copy of it with me today. Um, so I'll let Shana sell you it, uh, sell you it, um, tell you about it, but also hopefully sell you the idea of getting one. Um, but you can buy it through our website for just 19 pounds plus postage and patching. And please do buy it through um, our website, not other online retailers, because the profits from the sales of these books goes directly to helping us conserve historic, country, historic churches across the country. Now, if you've got any questions, any technical problems throughout the lecture, please do comment away. But also everyone, if you're joining us for the first time, um, especially hello to you today, do let us know where you're joining us from, but I hope you enjoyed the lecture today. So everybody, this is the book. It's called Magical House Protection by our speaker today, Brian Hoggard, The Archaeology of Counter Witchcraft. I've read this book, I thoroughly recommend it. And we're gonna be putting um, a link in the chat to the book now. So um, it, it gives me greatest pleasure to introduce Brian Hoggard, who's going to tell us today about concealed objects in buildings. So Brian, over to you. Thank you very much, Shana. So um, as George and Shana have said, I'm gonna be talking to you all today about the archeological evidence of magical house protection or building protection, with specific reference to the occurrence of these objects in churches. And so I'll just share my slideshow now. One second. That's just, I'm getting there, people, don't worry. <laughs> right. Here we go. Right. So, as um, suggested, if you want to find out more about um, me or my research, you can have a look at the website, which you can see there, which is difficult to spell. So, I'll give you a chance just to make a note of that. It's www.apertureapios.co.uk. And there's also some information about my social media presence there as well. So before I start talking about the objects themselves, it's important to try and get a sense of the context in which they were deposited and look at some of the reasons why people chose to protect buildings, including churches, from supernatural harm. So I tend to think that things were more magical back in the past. You know, people tended to believe in magic a bit more. There is lots of really good research showing that witchcraft beliefs continued well into the 20th century and particularly in rural areas of England and the rest of Europe indeed. A friend of mine, Jason Simmons, has written about magical beliefs in Cornwall, for example, in the early 20th century, looking at the work of William Painter. Um, but, you know, as, as we go back in time, you know, there's a visceral sense of magic as a powerful environmental force. And, um, and this was felt in urban areas as well as rural areas, but obviously a little bit less so in urban. Um, and also, you know, if you if we go back even further, perhaps to like a pre-Reformation church, um, churches in that era felt like magical places to be. There was incense, candlelight, paintings, lots of unusual sculptures. And of course, there were no motors or electricity to get in the way or to distract you from your awareness of your environment. Um, people were closer to nature and mortality, and um, the world around them was brought to life by folklore and the supernatural. There were many points in the landscape that were sort of liminal points of interaction with the other world, places like um, ancient trees on, on parish boundaries and ancient wells and stones. 
And um, also, we need to remember that well into the 20th century again, um, there were cunning folk at the heart of many communities. Um, cunning folk, we're talking about wise women and wise men, they were really essentially um, white witches, but by another name. Um, they performed services for the community, like divination, as in fortune telling, thief detection, they would do healing, they could create charms to protect you. And one of the roles they also um, took up was the detection of maleficium. In other words, they could identify witches and when witchcraft had occurred. Um, <clears throat> most of them earned a bit of money for their services or would barter for services. Um, and I would say that morally speaking, although I sort of um, characterize them as white witches, they were usually more sort of gray. You know, there were some that were more morally inclined than others. Um, just to give you an idea of the status that cunning people had in the community, in, in 1593, George Gifford, who kind of wrote a diary of his life, he complained that his parishioners treated the local cunning folk as if they were his god. So basically, he's saying that the cunning people were seen as higher than he was. So he was quite angry about that. Um, so the main point I want you to take from this is that magic was a reality for most people in the past, and it still is for some. Um, we also have, of course, the influence of the period of the witch trials. Obviously, there was a, a lot of panic about witches for a while, um, with the advent of popular printing as well. Pamphlets were produced talking about witchcraft, which made people talk about it a lot more. Um, so, you know, witchcraft became a, a live topic for a lot of people. Um, and you know, fear of it increased during the 17th century and persisted for a very long time. Um, witchcraft in England, the occurrence of it and the, the, the deaths of witches, it wasn't quite as bad as it was on the continent and in Scotland, because we had a slightly different process in England for dealing with witches. In England, if you wanted to accuse someone of witchcraft, you had to be able to prove that they had caused you harm by witchcraft. Um, whereas on the continent and in Scotland, it was more a case of proving some form of heresy or some sort of pact with the devil. And also in England, um, when um, people were executed for witchcraft, they did it using hanging rather than burning, which also is uh, a difference. Um, but that legal test, it kept a little bit of a cap on the numbers. So, so there weren't quite as many people, thankfully, who died um, because of witchcraft accusations in this country as there were in others. Um, and as I mentioned before about the cunning folk, uh, they often actually assisted in the tracing of sources of black magic. So they would identify witches sometimes who then did go to trial. Um, but, and they were rarely, rarely targets themselves, but they, they could be. Now, although people who were often accused of witchcraft were often guilty of nothing more than being poor or in the wrong place at the wrong time or giving someone a, a look, a peculiar look, um, we do know that people did actually um, they did actually do witchcraft, they did actually do black witchcraft because we find objects that prove that people were trying to curse each other and cause harm to each other using magic. So I'm gonna start with some slides that are a bit more interesting than, than the first one there. Okay, so these, these little figures here were found um, in the basement of a pub in Prestwich in Greater Manchester. And there's a basement of this pub is right next to a churchyard, which may be significant. And in the basement, they found a false wall behind which was a little bag containing these figures, which have been stylistically dated to the 17th century. They're very nicely carved. And they were found uh, behind this wall, along with a pile of what is described as vegetable matter, which appears to have been roots and things that have been collected for some kind of spell or ritual, and also um, a dead cat. So clearly there's some kind of nefarious activity going on here, which um, they wanted to hide, and they were prepared to build a new wall in order to hide it. Um, another example of people conducting um, black witchcraft is here. This is a lead curse tablet from the 17th century, which was discovered behind some panelling in Dimmock in Gloucestershire. Um, it's actually written in mirror writing. So this is a curse on Sarah Ellis, um, and it contains some symbols and sigils that are from uh, a, a grimoire that was popularly reprinted at the time. And then a little bit later, we have here a 19th century witch doll from Hereford. Uh, thanks to uh, Ben Mool for giving me access to this one. Um, but underneath the skirt of this doll was a written curse on Mary Ann Ward. And again, you know, if, if we've found these objects, albeit sometime considerably later after they were uh, originally hidden, you can bet that other people knew that objects like this were being concealed and that black people were trying to do black witchcraft on other people. And if they were aware of it, that could lead to fear and hence why people would then seek to protect themselves from witchcraft. And of course, this then went across into the churches as well. 
So since I began doing research on this topic in 1999, I've recorded over a thousand objects in my files. And in addition to this, the Concealed Shoes Index in Northampton, for there is one, um, has recorded over 2000 footwear specific finds as well. The most common types of objects that are found protecting buildings is things like witch bottles, concealed shoes, dried cats, which we'll be talking about in a bit, uh, written charms, um, protection marks, and horse skulls and other animal bones. So we'll start looking at witch bottles. Okay, so <clears throat> the example you're looking at on the screen was found in a cottage in Falmersham in Bedfordshire. Um, but I want to start by saying that, strictly speaking, witch bottles, in exactly the way that they were first used in the third quarter of the 17th century, that type of bottle hasn't been found in churches. Um, and this is because the way they were thought to work depended specifically on the nature of the relationship between the witch and her or his intended victim. So generally speaking, as I'm sure you can imagine, people lived in houses rather than churches, and it's their homes where we tend to find these bottles. But um, that said, bottles have been found in churches, such as the one Shana mentioned in Ipswich earlier on, and they do appear to have a function related to protection, but not necessarily in exactly the same way as the more normally encountered witch bottles. Um, I will be describing um, some finds in churches and churchyards a little bit later, but I just want to explain how um, a more conventional kind of witch bottle was thought to work so that you can see the differences and why we're not finding them so much in churches. So, as I said, this one was, uh, this is a 17th century witch bottle from a 17th century cottage in Bedfordshire. Now, the type of bottle we're looking at here, you can see it's quite anthropomorphic. It looks like a little human figure. It's got a, a big round belly. It's got a fairly vicious looking face on the mask. And the salt glaze gives it this mottled effect, like a kind of skin-like effect. Um, these bottles are actually technically known as Bartman stoneware, and they come mainly from the Rhineland in Germany. They're imported in vast quantities into England, um, filled with wine or beer. And because stoneware is so durable, when they were when the when the drink was consumed, they would be used for other things. And you know, let's be honest, if you were thinking of doing some kind of magic or counter magic, there could not really be a more perfect looking bottle than this. It looks quite creepy, and you can imagine why uh, people would use it. But also the main thing is that it's anthropomorphic. Now, there are some early texts, so from the late 17th century which describe using bottles to repel or counter witchcraft. So for example, Joseph Blagrave's Astrological Practice of Physic from 1671 talks about um, taking the urine of a victim of witchcraft, putting it into a bottle with some pins and heating on fire. And the thinking was that by doing this, it would cause excruciating pain to the witch, who would then come to your house begging for you to stop boiling the bottle, and in return, you could barter for them to unbewitch you. Now, that particular practice that particular practice seems to be separate to the one where we find these buried bottles. So the boiling, seem, it doesn't seem to matter where the boiling takes place, um, you can just do it pretty much anywhere. Whereas the buried bottles, there are some characteristics about the locations where we find those. So we tend to find half of all the buried bottles tend to be concentrated by the hearth and um, another 25% are uh, located by thresholds and the remaining 25% can be found pretty much anywhere, sometimes in open land, sometimes at boundary points. <clears throat> so we seem to have bottles that are boiled according to the texts, and then we've got the buried bottles, which have quite a few differences. And I think that there's two very distinct different practices going on here, because the texts don't refer to including locks of hair or nail pairings, or specifically bending the pins and nails, which is what we find in the buried ones. So for example, here is one that was found in Ipswich, and you can see that we've got these bent nails and include a broken fork at the top there. And we've got a big lock of hair as well. Now the, um, the bending of the nails and the lock of hair would not be mentioned in those texts. Um, and we, we all, almost always find iron in these um, deliberately buried witch bottles of some kind. And here, here's a later example, some contents from a later example. It was discovered in Greenwich, which I worked on this one in the early 2000s. And you can see how bent these nails are. And my colleague, Dr. Arnold, Alan Massey, he um, measured the radii of all these bends, and he's just discerned that they were all bent around the same metal bar, but to varying degrees, uh, which shows that they were deliberately bent as part of the process of creating the witch bottle. It's part of the ritual, if you like. Um, <clears throat> and here is an x-ray of that bottle as well, which was discovered inverted beneath the uh, floor of the building. 
and so all the uh, metal pins and nails, a lot of them had concreted together in the uh, in the, in the uh, neck of the bottle. So the popularity of the hearth uh, helps us understand what might be going on with these bottles. Um, it seems to be that if people thought they were bewitched, um, they would suspect that a witch somewhere had aimed some magic at them, some dark magic, and that they might continue to do so. And so if you imagine, because we have to try and imagine a lot here, because we're talking about people believing in magic and believing it can travel around and cause harm. So if you imagine someone has produced a spell, if you like, and sent it towards you, it's traveling across the landscape, it's come to your house, it's trying to get into the house to harm you, doors and windows are shut, <clears throat> but the chimney is always open to the sky, so it plunges down the chimney, it senses this anthropomorphic feature at the bottom, this human-like character that has your hair and your urine and your nail pairings in it, and it plunges in there and it becomes impaled or killed by the ritually killed pins and nails which are within, and that seems to be what's going on with witch bottles. And I hope that that explains why we don't find so many of those inside churches, because churches don't have hearths and people don't tend to live in them. But we do get people who want to protect that place still from evil. And it seems that by including bottles in the fabric of the building, um, you're getting some of the effect, if you like, of a witch bottle. It's like an echo of the practice that was uh, happening with witch bottles. So uh, for example, in Anstey in Hertfordshire, a green glass bottle was discovered in the tower there. Um, in West Yorkshire, at a place called Addingham, a witch pot was found in the churchyard. Now, these ones that are found in the churchyard are a little bit different. So, um, <clears throat> similarly, in Bradworthy in Devon, a corked jar with pins inside it and some thorns was found in the churchyard. And the local legend there said that in order to destroy the power of a witch, it was necessary to bury such a bottle in three different churchyards. And not far away in Monkley, we find exactly the same type of bottle. So maybe it was a widespread belief in the Southwest that you could bury certain types of bottles in the churchyard to destroy the power of a witch. And as Charlotte mentioned earlier, we've got the bottle from uh, St Mary's on the Quay in Ipswich, which is embedded in the wall, pretty much like the one that we mentioned for Hertfordshire earlier. And um, we get bottles concealed in buildings like um, with, no, with no contents quite often, actually. And, and I think this is kind of a derivative or a descendant from the original witch bottle idea. But um, <clears throat> as I said, in churches, because there aren't people there and there aren't hearths there, the um, occurrence of them is a little bit different. Um, we have one interesting example from Wembley from the early 20th century, which was found beneath the concrete floor at St Augustine's Church, which was a little bottle that was found under the floor there. It had some liquid inside it and had a little porcelain figure of a witch. And so again, that seems to be, you know, a very, a very <laughs> sort of really descended version of the idea as well. And then there are even um, examples, well, there's at least one example of a witch bottle that was found inside the coffin of a young man, an 18th century um, burial in Lawton or Lufton, which is near Milton Keynes, where a steeple bottle was found <clears throat> laying alongside him with lots of pins in the, in the lid. And uh, that seems to be some kind of effort to protect the mortal remains of that person from witchcraft. Or perhaps it was thought that he died of witchcraft and this was um, further attempts to stop people from meddling with his remains. Okay, so the next type of object we're going to talk about is concealed shoes. <clears throat> so concealed shoes have been found in every county of England and they're known throughout Britain. Um, they occur in Ireland, America, Europe as well. Um, they are um, common everywhere really, um, but unlike witch bottles where we know that practice began in the third quarter of the 17th century, shoes just seem to be everywhere already. And some of the earliest examples we have of shoes are actually from the 14th century in this country. Um, shoes can be found singly, um, for example, uh, an 18th century clog found behind lath and plaster in Norwich, um, or in large groups where you have 18 boots and shoes from the 19th century, which have been discovered hidden away in Little Morton Hall in Cheshire. Um, shoes can be found in chimneys. About 10% of the shoes that are found are pairs and they're all very well worn. 40% belong to children and the remainder are broadly split between men and women. Um, Part of the reason why shoes are so well worn is because they were relatively expensive in the past. They would be repaired over and over again, so they couldn't be repaired anymore. And so they end up uh, being a unique record of the wearer's foot. And um, it seems that this is also one of the reasons why they may have been concealed. Um, similar to how with the witch bottles, you've got the hair and the urine and the, the nail pairings to make this energy think that you are that you're somewhere where you're not. <clears throat> seems to be the same with the shoe. It's a unique record of your foot acts as a decoy, so any energy coming into the house that might be trying to harm you may attack it instead of you. Um, we also have this other belief associated with shoes, which is very interesting. So this is John Sean, 
and John Sean was an unofficial English saint. Um, he was never canonised. Um, he was a real person who lived in the early 14th century in North Marston in Buckinghamshire, where there was a shrine to him for a long time. And he is reputed to have cast the devil into a boot, hence the pilgrim badge. This is a replica showing uh, the devil popping out of a boot there. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, the um, pilgrimages to his shrine were, were really, really popular. In fact, at one point, they were second only to Thomas a Becket. So these pilgrim badges were extremely widespread. And so this image of the devil being trapped in a boot or a type of footwear was extremely widely distributed. And it was also included on many rude screens. So, um, so there was a kind of popular idea that you could um, catch devils or catch evil in boots. Now, whether that was recorded uh, by this legend about John Sean, as in whether, whether it was something that previously exist and that pre previously existed and the idea was embodied in the legend of John Sean, or whether it started with this legend about him, we're not sure. But certainly it's interesting. And um, you know, with, with churches, we also get, um, you know, apart from the shoe, the actual shoes that we find in churches, we also get a lot of shoe outlines. So in the cloisters in Canterbury Cathedral, for example, there are huge numbers of these. And we also see them really regularly on um, engraved into the lead on roofs as well. Um, so let's look at some of the actual shoes that were found. So very recently, in fact, um, just a couple of months ago, uh, these shoes were discovered in the eaves in Holy Trinity in Cheltenham, which is a Victorian era church and the boots of Victorian era as well. And they've just been lying there undisturbed for a very long time. And then similarly, at the School of Art and Design in Lincoln, which was formerly St. Michael's Church, um, this pair of men's leather slippers were found concealed under the floorboards as well. Now, before we start looking at the next fine type, I just want to give you a kind of trigger warning, really, because we're going to be looking at dried cats. And the first image I'm going to show you is of a dried cat. OK, so it might be worth just peeping through your fingers before you have a proper look at this. But I'm going to give you a second or two just to turn away if you wish. Um, right, so here we go. <clears throat> So this is a dried cat from uh, Eckington in Worcestershire, which is a village I used to live in. And um, it was found between some layers of thatch during rethatching. And you can see that it's been squashed fairly flat by the thatch. Um, the thatcher was of the opinion that the cat had been deliberately concealed in the roof. And in fact, there is many cases of cats that have been deliberately concealed and it can be proven that they were deliberately concealed. Um, for example, one from Dalton in Yorkshire, where, um, sorry, it might be Nottinghamshire, sorry, where um, a cat was tied to joists by metal wire as well. Um, and some have been sort of sealed in, cemented into places as well. Now, cats, as they approach the end of their life, they do tend to crawl away to die. But, um, but definitely many of these were deliberately um, included. And you also have to ask yourself, why would someone tolerate the smell from an animal like this when you could remove it um, if they didn't actually want it to be there? Um, so here's another example. This, this one is on display in the Red Cat Hotel in Norfolk. Um, and for many years it's hung there and it still is there now. But, um, but some people thought it wasn't real. So a local dentist had it x-rayed to prove that it was real. Um, speculation about the reasons why cats are interred in buildings. People used to think, uh, and sometimes still do, that it's a type of foundation sacrifice. But um, normally foundation sacrifices are in the foundations. And normally it's to do, if you like, with appeasing the spirit of place to make sure that no harm comes to anybody later on. Um, whereas cats are found usually higher up in the building and they can be found in all sorts of locations, often in ceilings. And, um, and in fact, this practice goes on, you know, I've got examples well into the 20th century. Um, but um, I think that the explanation for these animals is more about the perceived qualities of, of cats. Um, they're very alert, they're a little bit mysterious, they're uh, semi-nocturnal, and they are beneficial to humans in their role as vermin catchers. And my feeling is that um, it was hoped that in death, the cats could provide a service for the humans by catching more spiritual kinds of vermin, like perhaps negative energies that might be trying to get into the building. It may seem outlandish, but if you try and think about the way people who believe in magic think, it, it could be, it's, it's a good explanation. Um, other people have suggested that maybe cats were concealed in buildings that act as vermin scarers, but um, anyone who knows the behaviour of rats and such would know that they would very quickly learn that an animal was dead and would not fear it any longer. So cats that have been found in churches. Um, there's one that was found in St Cuthbert's Church in Clifton, sandwiched between plaster and slates. Um, one was found in Waltham Abbey in Essex. We've got another one found in um, 
Church of St. Thomas of Becket in Hepton Stall in West Yorkshire. One was found in the Church of St. Mary's in Devizes, St. Thomas's in Salisbury. Um, there's a couple of churches in London where we found cats as well. One was recovered in uh, Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin. Um, there was one found in an 18th century chapel in New Jersey in America. So yeah, they're pretty widespread. <clears throat> now, the next type of object we'd like to talk about is um, written charms. Okay, so written charms, this is where you might feel that you needed some extra help in protecting yourself or your property or your family. And you would then commission um, a cunning person, one of these wise men or wise women I was talking about earlier on, to create one for you. So this particular one is a 19th century example, mid 19th century from a place called Sarn in, in Wales. It's a fantastic example. The National Library of Wales has many examples um, in their collection. <clears throat> now, when we look at these uh, charms, we have to look, um, look at them in the round, as it were. Um, these are artifacts. They were deliberately concealed. They were folded many times. They were carefully written. They include a lot of words, but they also include a lot of symbols as well. So at the bottom left-hand corner, we've got the abracadabra kind of uh, magical um, repetition. At the bottom, we've also got some astrological symbols, the moon, Mercury, Jupiter, star, sun. We've got ya, ya, ya written at the bottom, which is um, sort of an invocation to God. And then bottom right, we have a sigil from the Seal of Solomon as well. And, um, <clears throat> and so all together, what we've got here is a real mix of sources of supernatural power. And um, because the text refers to Jesus Christ an awful lot, but we've also got this sort of Arabic magic in the bottom left, astrological magic at the bottom, and ritual magic in the bottom right. And then we've got the, the whole effort that went into concealing them with the secrecy associated with that, which we're finding with all these other objects which were there to um, protect. Um, so the text of this charm reads, uh, I'm just going to read a bit of it because it's obviously very long. <clears throat> and it says, Lord Jesus Christ, be the preserver of William Pentrinant, his cows, calves, milk, butter, cattle of all ages, mares, suckers, horses of all ages, ewes, lambs, sheep of all ages, pigs, sows, and prosper him on this farm to live luckily, save from all witchcraft and evil, men or women, spirits or wizards, or hardness of heart. Amen. And so, you know, the, the meaning of the charm is obviously very clear, but combined with these magical sources. But then we also have to consider that this concealment of this charm on a property was the final act of a series of rituals that might have taken several weeks, where the cunning person would repeatedly visit the property and go around all the corners um, doing rituals and maybe even more deposits at those places before finally creating this charm and depositing it, depositing it as the final act. Now, we have charms like this recorded from Dorset, Yorkshire, Lancashire, Somerset, Devon, Gloucestershire, Shropshire, um, all over Wales, all, all parts of England. Um, and they're, they're incredible things, um, but they're obviously very fragile. So most of the survivals we have are Victorian rather than earlier. Um, but there is one example that definitely, very definitely was concealed inside a church, which is at Cascob Church in Radnorshire in Wales again. And it was an abracadabra charm similar to that one. Um, this is a kind of, <clears throat> a bridged version that was created for a, a print that Graham Hobbs, I think, was producing for sale. But you can see that it's essentially the same kind of charm. And it was concealed in a church. So again, the fact that it was in a church, um, people still felt the need to do it. Um, another example of a charm was recovered from behind the brass plate on an old tombstone in the Lancashire churchyard, which was, again, seems to have been to protect the mortal remains of that person. And it was combined with um, a magical square as well. So the next fine type we're going to talk about is horse skulls. <clears throat> so horse skulls, you can see from this picture, this, in this example from Cardiganshire, they're large. Um, so, you know, it takes a lot of effort to sort one out. I mean, obviously pre-motor pre vehicles, horses were the main way of getting around. And um, there were disposal yards for horses quite regularly called knackers yards where you could acquire horse skulls. So they were a bit more readily available than they would be now. Um, but you look at the size of them and uh, they're quite, quite remarkable things to look at. So various people have tried to um, <clears throat> analyze and interpret what the meaning of concealed horse skulls is all about. Um, I'll talk more about where they're found in a moment, but um, but in 1945, Sean O'Sullivan, he was a member of the uh, Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, conducted a survey in Ireland looking at little Irish peasant cottages to find out how many of them had these horse skulls in and how people interpreted their presence. And um, a great many horse skulls had them. 
uh, sorry, a great many of these cottages had these horse skulls concealed under slabs in front of the fireplace. And their explanation was that it made the dancing sound better in the evening. But, um, but O'Sullivan did sort of rejected that. He thought that was a, a, an explanation to, to, to do away with suspicion, if you like. And he thought that it was much more to do with foundation sacrifices. Um, I would also mention that the proximity to the fireplace is similar to the proximity to the fireplace of witch bottles and things. So it seems like it's a protection of the fireplace, to my mind, um, connected with some kind of foundation ritual. Um, in 1949, a Swedish researcher called Albert Sandklaff, um, he did some work on horse skulls in Sweden, particularly um, about threshing barns. And people were telling him that it made the singing flails sound better when they were threshing. Um, he accepted that because they were, um, that's what people told him, but he kept an open mind and thought maybe there's a more ancient practice behind this. Uh, and then somebody called Euron William, he also did an analysis of horse skulls found in Wales um, in the year 2000 and was looking at uh, um, protection being the key purpose for that. And that's what people told him as well. And um, uh, there may be an ancient connection with foundation sacrifice as well. In England, one really good example, uh, an inn called the Portway at Staunton on Wye in Herefordshire. 24 horse skulls were found screwed to the underside of the floor, allegedly to make the fiddle go better. Um, and many more horse skulls were found at another um, building nearby as well. So essentially, we've got these people saying that it's um, there's an acoustic benefit to having horse skulls um, concealed under your building or in your building. And then we've also got this idea from the scholars that there's a more ancient connection potentially with um, protection or with foundation sacrifice. I lean towards the protection side of it as well. I think that the acoustic theory was probably um, the sort of thing you could easily tell a suspicious priest who sees you walking down the street with a horse skull under your arm. Um, oh, it's to make the sound better. You know, um, it was it's a way of explaining away what you're doing. Um, that's what I think. Um, again, when we think of the reasons why a horse skull might have been chosen to go underneath um, a stone or underneath a building, there's a bunch of reasons really. I mean. The burying of horses and horse skulls is actually really ancient. It goes back into prehistory. Um, so there seems to be some really ancient linear connection, which I think is more about the foundation sacrifice side of things. But, but if we talk about the way horses are in life, um, they have a broadly benevolent role in human life. It could be that they're seen as a protector as well in some way. Um, I wonder as well whether horses, um, because they're capable of sleeping, standing up and sleeping with their eyes open, whether it led to an association that they're highly vigilant um, I have my own horse girl called Herbert, who's on a shelf behind me right now, and I'm also a musician, and I don't notice any acoustic benefit when I play my guitar in front of Herbert, um, but you know, I don't know if that's me or, the, or Herbert <laughs> involved in that one. Um, Defleshed horse skulls like this one, um, they are fearsome looking things, and they were included in many um, folk dances and practices, like, such as the Mary Lloyd in Wales and the Hood and a Horse down in Kent, which is more of a simulation of a horse skull in that case. Um, and with those traditions, uh, they may not be as ancient as the practice of concealing horse skulls for foundation sacrifices, but there can be an element of cleaning or sweeping of the hearth to do with those rituals, which may be to do with protection as well. So some examples. Um, in Elsdon Church in Northumberland, uh, three horse skulls were found in a chamber above the Belfry in 1837. Um, in that church, they're now on display in this lovely little case. Um, and again, it seems like uh, I, I think that maybe it's to do with the function of bells, which is partly to scare away evil spirits. Um, and then Ivan Bunn also reports on uh, horse bones and jaw bones of sheep, which were found beneath the floor of St. Bottles Church in Boston, Lincolnshire. Um, at New Church in Powys, beneath the floorboards of a 19th century nonconformist chapel, a large bone from a cow or bullock exists. A couple of other examples from Wales here, a chapel at Breckfer in Breckenshire, several horse skulls were found in the ceiling. In 1827, four horse skulls were found in a Calvinist chapel in Pembrokeshire. Uh, there are some in Clandaff Cathedral, which were found in the choir stalls. And regarding horse skulls, I'll finish on this uh, quote from Enid Porter's Cambridgeshire Customs and Folklore from 1969. <clears throat> it's worth reading this in full. Um, W.H. Barrett recalls that his uncle, a builder, secured the contract in 1897 for erecting a primitive Methodist chapel at Black Horse Drove. One day he sent his nephew, then age six, with his elder brother to the knacker's yard to buy a horse's head. When the two boys returned with it, they watched the workmen dig the trench for the foundations and then saw their uncle carefully mark the center of the site by driving into the ground a wooden stake. The men gathered around while their uncle uncorked a bottle of beer, then the horse's head was placed in the bottom of the trench. 
The first glass of liquor poured out from the bottle was thrown onto it. And then when the rest of the beer had been drunk, the men shoveled bricks and mortar on top of the head. It was explained to W.H. Barrett that this was an old heathen custom to drive evil and witchcraft away. So there we have um, a nice late 19th century example of um, people building a chapel, including a horse's head and doing a little ritual on a horse's head before building the chapel. So other things you find in churches for warding off evil, there's a wide variety of protection marks, which if any of you have seen my previous lectures for the CCT, you'll know that there's a lot of those. Um, there's things like daisy wheels, there are Mari marks, there are mesh marks, and there are things like deliberate burn marks as well. And again, you'll find these on the CCT YouTube channel or in previous videos on Facebook. So it's clear that from the earliest times and well into the 20th century, many people have had a sense that there is a supernatural world out there which contains things that can cause harm. This fear was substantial enough for people to modify their properties and to include measures to counter this harmful magic. It's clear too from the evidence that people sought to protect churches from supernatural harm too. Um, this could be a combination of a desire to protect the dead within the church and the general desire to keep the church free of evil influence. And with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, that was a phenomenal lecture. Um, everyone, you will have noticed um, someone's come sat down beside me and it's because um, uh, the word cat was mentioned. Um, so I'm just glad the word fox wasn't mentioned. Otherwise we've had this, there you go. Um, if the, the F word in this house is fox. So if that's mentioned, this one's um, jumping all around. But um, I'm gonna quickly pass you over to Sharna, who's gonna quickly again, just show you um, today's book. So if you'd like to get hold of Brian's book, which talks about um, various themes explored in today's lecture, Sharna has it. And I think Sharna's gonna tell you also her favorite part from this book as well. Well, I'm particularly interested in the witch bottles. I mean, it's all fan fantastic. And I particularly enjoyed the, um, the ga gazetteer at the back. Um, so it's a really great book and you can buy it um, with the link in the chat. Now I have to apologize to Brian because I lost my bio for you at the beginning of this. So I, I sort of um, <laughs> dropped you in the deep end without introducing you properly. So you're an independent researcher and you've been working on the archeology span of magical house protection since the late 1990s, I believe. Um, and this book was published um, in 2019. So um, we have um, a couple of questions, but I first want to ask you, Brian, what got you interested in this really fascinating subject? Um, well, I've always been interested in weird things for a start. I'll, I'll start with that. But um, but I did a, I did a degree in the history of witchcraft, uh, history, degree in history, sorry, uh, which concentrated in the final year, in my case, on the history of witchcraft. And while doing that, I came across a book by Ralph Merrifield, which was published in 1987, which is called The Archaeology of Ritual and Magic. And in that book, there's a chapter that deals with the type of finds I've just been talking about. Um, and I thought there's got to be more to find out about all of this. And that's when I started my research on that topic, because I knew there must be much more out there. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I've always hoped that I would find something in a place that I've lived. I live in quite a modern house at the moment, um, but I love old buildings. And someone in there has made a comment saying, I'm in Suffolk and my cottage dates to pre-1600. We have a witch's bottle buried in the fireplace and many markings on beams like the Marion marks, which I know you've talked about previously. Um, so yeah. absolutely fascinating. Please everyone comment away if you <clears> found anything. And also, did you put it back? Um, Brian, I went to a talk of yours a while ago where he said some workmen got rid of a cat into the skip. And I think something happened and they then put it back because they were they were worried about the the curse or something yeah it was um <clears throat> an old builder friend of mine called dave from pershaw they were they were converting um cream court which is now a national trust property and they were converting the stables there into apartments and they found a dried cat sitting on a, a noggin he called it which is a beam and there were two lath and plaster panels either side and there was this dried cat sitting on the beam which had clearly been um i think a tortoise shell i think it was from all the fur that had dropped out of it and they all stopped work because they were scared of it. Um, the supervisor told Dave he had to remove it. He didn't want to remove it. He was eventually ordered to remove it. Took it downstairs, really didn't like it at all. Put it in the skip as instructed. And on his way back up the stairs, a newly installed plaster panel fell off the ceiling and gashed his head open. And all of the people on site are convinced it's because they got rid of the cat. Um, other people may have different opinions on exactly what happened there. But yeah, that's, that's what they believe. 
I think I would have left it. Um, so thanks for that. I love those little stories. Um, George, I think you're going to field the rest of the questions. Thanks, Sean. And again, thanks, Brian, for those um, little snippets there. But as everyone, as um, Sean said, if you'd like to get hold of Brian's book, you can do so. It's £19 plus potion packaging. And as I said before, all proceeds go to um, us at the CCT in helping us to conserve historic churches in our care. Now, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I mean, it's really interesting ones coming in. If you've got more, please keep them coming um, and I'll do my best to get through them. Now, Brian, I'm going to kick off. Um, obviously, you showed us some really um, quite moving images of dried cats and someone's um, said, were they deliberately killed um, before they went to the walls? Were they put in alive or had they died of natural causes and then put into the walls? Or do we not know? We do know, actually. Um, there are a couple of examples where there is definitely claw marks in the chambers, which suggests that the cat was alive when it was concealed. And um, in other cases, it's clear that the cat was dead before it was concealed. Pretty sad stuff. Uh, and is there any theory behind it, or, you know, why they might be put alive versus why they may have been killed before? Um, I think it really depends uh, to a degree on the cruelty of the person doing it, really. Because, I mean, I can't imagine ever killing a cat, um, personally. But, but obviously in the past, before cats were spayed and neutered, they would breed um, you know, very prolifically. And sometimes there would be too many. Thanks, Brian. Um, and I'm going to go on to some nicer questions now, because that was quite a sad, quite a sad thing looking at the cats. But I think it was a, an interesting question. So thank you um, for asking that question. Um, were there any, is there any evidence suggest that when you showed us the written charms, were they um, approved of by the incumbent of the parish church? Um, all we can say about that is that it seems that the protection marks which were put in churches were tolerated by the clergy. So I can only assume that the charms were treated in a similar way. Um, and people did have access to their churches. It's possible to to sneak in and put things, uh, you know, in difficult to reach places. So, so yeah, I think that um, definitely the priests were aware of the sort of sort of work that the cunning folk were doing, and it was tolerated to some degree. And um, when you um, showed the um, images of the horse skulls, and you said you got Herbert on your bookshelf um, behind you. Um, is there any connection with horse skulls and um, uh, the Welsh um, Mary Lloyd? Lloyd? Mary Lloyd, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, well, this is something I'm uh, gonna be talking about um, at a conference in about a week and a half. Um, but yeah, there does seem to be some, some link, um, but it's fairly tenuous at the moment because um, most people researching uh, the practice of that dance say that it's maybe in the region of sort of 400 years old, 500 years old, but that's really about the earliest evidence of it. Um, but there could be a connection because obviously it's core skulls. And as I mentioned in my lecture, there is sometimes with the Mary Lloyd um, an element of sweeping of the heart path involved in that ritual, which could be to do with um, sweeping away evil as well. Now, obviously, um, for those of you watching um, who have seen Harry Potter and a lot of those films, we know there are um, some interesting spells and incantations that J.K. Rowling creates in her book series. But someone's asked a particular question, Brian, I'm going to see if you might know the answer to. Um, but what is the meaning of abracadabra? Ah, uh, see, so this is, you're, you're going to catch me out on this one, because I, I, have, I have looked at that before, but I haven't got it fresh in my head, I'm afraid. No worries about that. We'll see if we can get a blog um, uh, answering that question um, later on um, this year, everyone. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, but um, I'm just going to go through some more of these questions. Um, now, some said, wasn't there a wax effigy of King Edward VI as a baby found as a concealed object? Do you know anything about that wax effigy? I don't know about that, but I would like to know more. <laughs> so, yeah, come back. If you know that, please do comment the details because, as Brian said, we'd like to know more about that. Um, Brian, is this um, when you talked about the cunning folk um, doing um, the, creating these protections? Is it a case really of witchcraft being used to counter witchcraft? Um, and where was the distinction made? Um, you could look at it that way, but or you could look at it as magical forces being used for good or ill. And so people using those forces for good against evil. That's really what their role was. Yeah. And do we find, it, particularly maybe in rural communities, um, I'm thinking maybe in Cornwall or, as you said, in, on the Welsh borders, where the, where it's harder to get to, as say, as uh, as opposed to major cities, do we find such um, magical charms and the use of magical protection objects and concealed objects a lot more prol prolific in those areas? Uh, I'd say that not so much more prolific, just lasting longer. 
Um, so, so you know, obviously culture changes and modernizes and advances, and as it does, so it tends to shed these old practices. Um, but you know, the, the more rural, the more chance of finding them still alive, essentially. And um, what's the favorite or your most favorite discovery of a concealed object in a church that you found or researched? Uh, of those found in churches, um, hmm, good question. I think it's got to be just the horse skulls. Generally, I've got a I've got a thing about the horse skulls. I think it's um, I think it's really fascinating that people included them in buildings without their congregation knowing. Sometimes maybe without even the priests of the clergy knowing. But this um, strong tradition continues. It's quite interesting, particularly the horse girls, because I know everyone's heard me say it before, but Bury St. Edward's my hometown. And when they did excavations at the Abbey Gate, they found um, piles uh, of wolf skulls. So they don't know if it's connection to the legend of St. Edmund, who was a, um, his head was, um, his decapitated head was guarded by a wolf. So they don't know if it's connection with that, but it's quite interesting seeing how animal remains um, and skeletons are used and concealed in such, um, you know, uh, religious buildings. Mm, yeah. Uh, Brian, is there any suggestion um, to say that, you know, because obviously cunning folk um, created these charms, did people eventually turn against the cunning folk and accuse any of those of witchcraft? Um, certainly some cunning people were accused of witchcraft, um, but, you know, not excessively so, I would say. I mean, they, they tended to just sort of fizzle out, really. I mean, in some rural areas uh, like Cornwall, um, there are still people who are charmers, which can sometimes be one of the roles of a cunning person. Where there'll be like war charmers or specific kind of horse healers. So there are still some vestiges of the roles of the cunning folk undertook um, in existence, but it has just gradually diminished. Um, but there wasn't suddenly a, a mass revolt against the cunning folk or anything like that. They've always been valued whenever they, whenever, wherever they've existed. And obviously, um, during the persecutions against which, well, you know, uh, I say persecution against witches, um, but, you know, with witch finder general and, um, you know, such a, you know, witch hunts taking place across England, were cunning folk targeted by witch finder general as well? Um, generally speaking, the people who were targeted were people who were um, accused. And usually people didn't accuse their useful neighbouring cunning folk. Um, but occasionally they could be caught up in it if they were accused by the wrong person. And obviously, Matthew Hopkins, which finds a general, he's kind of an aberration in the history of English witchcraft, really. He, he took the law into his own hands and behaved in a way which, which other people didn't in the rest of the country. So he's a bit of an odd one. <laughs> Thanks for that answer, Brian. And uh, someone just asked a uh, submitted question here. Why does iron protect against spells and why are the nails bent? OK, well, the bending, I, th I think I did say in the lecture, but um, it's like a ritual killing. If you imagine that a, a pin or a nail is alive in some way, by bending or breaking it, you've killed it. And so there's a kind of spiritual artefact that may be useful in magical protection in some way. And that seems to be what was going on with that kind of deliberate bending. But the, uh, the idea of iron warding off witchcraft and evil actually goes back to ancient beliefs about the blacksmith and the sort of magic transmutation of minerals into iron and that it could have some power against evil. And is, by extension, is that a reason why we find in certain churchyards a lot of um, iron um, graves um, or particularly iron, wrought iron railings around graves? Is there a connection between that idea of warding off spirits and trying to protect graves? No, I think that's, I mean, there they could be, but I think that predominantly that's more to do with protecting against um, grave robbers and um, sort of symbolising some sort of guardianship over the bodies, because that's more of a more of a later thing, isn't it, the iron on the graves. But, um, but yeah, we do find iron, like cast iron firebacks and things in fireplaces, sometimes have symbols on them as well to protect against witchcraft, and there you've got the idea of iron combined with symbolism. And obviously we've spoken a lot about witchcraft and uh, about humans, but is there any suggestion of um, sort of, you know, a concealed objects being um, used to try and ward off um, demons or anything, you know, any sort of demonic attacks? Yeah, I actually think that people were more concerned with fairies than they were about demons. Because um, obviously before the Victorian reimagination of fairies as tiny little winged creatures, um, the belief was that there was a parallel race of creatures that were known as the fairy that um, were living in a parallel universe to ours, really. And at certain points in the landscape, such as round barrows and ancient standing stones, those worlds could connect. And if you knew the right um, ritual, the right ways of seeing, you could interact with them. But likewise, if you upset the fairies, if you build on one of their pathways, or if you build on one of their houses, they could take action against you by firing elf shot at you. 
And so when people found little prehistoric arrowheads, they thought that that was evidence of the fairies' arrowheads. And so, yeah, so you had to watch out for the fairy. But yeah, people were also scared of demons, but that's more something that they learned from the church. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. And um, everyone, I've um, not had any other questions. So um, if you've got any other questions, now is your chance to get your last um, question in before we um, bring the lecture to a close. Um, but Brian, I suppose, um, uh, one of the things I should ask, what's next in terms of your research into looking into these kind of objects? Uh, well, I'm doing some more work um, on horse skulls at the moment, which some of which will be coming out at the conference um, in a week and a half. But I'm also interested in the um, origin and distribution of the daisy wheel symbol as well, which is the, um, the six pestle rosette sort of pattern that we find. And I've just seen that one quick question that's coming. The idea about fey folk and fairies, um, was that something um, very much rooted in um, the culture of the British Isles, or did we see that um, across Europe? Uh, well, the, the fairy beliefs, they manifest, I'm not an expert on uh, its existence throughout Europe, but it has different kinds of manifestation throughout Europe. I mean, I know there's a very strong fairy belief in Scandinavia, but the British, the British Isles in particular does have a very strong fairy belief. Um, and obviously Ireland, the island of Ireland as well has a very strong fairy belief. And um, yeah, going back a very long time. So um, yeah, but there are variations on it as you go around the world. There, there seems to be some belief in a kind of mystical parallel culture existing uh, almost wherever you find humans. Thanks, Brian. And everyone, thank you so much for your questions today. Um, that kind of brings today's lunchtime lecture to a close. Um, next week, um, do join us at the same time. We're going to be joined um, once again by Professor Andrew Chandler, um, who's a professor of modern history at the University of Chichester. Now, um, Professor Chandler is going to be coming back to us to give us a follow-up lecture, but this is a standalone lecture, so you haven't, needn't have seen his first lecture. But this um, lecture he's doing for us next week is entitled, Why do, Church, why do Churches Close? and why are they closing in growing numbers today? So we're gonna be looking at why do churches close and looking at trends, looking at changes in society, which may mean or may lead to further churches closing. But after that, um, do join us um, for our October lecture series. I've been putting details over the last um, week or so about the October lectures, and you'll see there's a slight spooky theme to our October series. Um, so we're kicking it off um, with a book launch um, and that's Faith and Fury, The Last Witches of England. Um, and that's going to be um, done by John Callow, who is a honorary research um, fellow at the University of Suffolk, um, who's got a brand new book coming out about the last witches of England. And um, we're going to be looking at the um, rather gory history of the black market in dealing and trading um, medieval um, relics of saints. Um, and we're also looking at the history of the English exorcism, um, looking at medieval manuscripts, as well as um, looking at other records and um, historical um, details about um, exorcism rituals in England. Um, so do have a look at those um, lectures. I'm working on the November series as well at the moment, so you'll be seeing details of um, those lectures coming up very soon. But also, as I said at the start of this lecture, I'm now booking in dates for January um, and beyond, so do keep a lookout. But as always, if you've got any ideas for lectures that you'd like us to look at hosting please do let us know you can comment you can send us a facebook message or you can email me at digital at the cct.org.uk and finally as i said you can buy brian's book from us today for just 19 pounds plus potion packaging i'll comment away with link to um that on our website um but also everyone if you um have enjoyed this lecture please do consider making a donation you can do it through our website which is visitchurch.org.uk as i said you can text donate you can text cct to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds or you can become a member with us um from just three pound fifty a month and if you use direct pay by direct debit and if you use the offer code lecture and that's lecture in capitals you'll get a free copy of this wonderful wonderful book by a previous lunchtime lecture of ours dr richard stemp now there's other benefits of being a member with us you get um regular communications from us um there's a new brand new lecture series that is only available to our lecture uh, sorry to our um, members um, that's been going out for several months and we've got some really cracking lectures lined up for members coming up too um, 
as well as that, there's going to be some new benefits coming um, shortly that I'm looking forward to telling everyone about, hopefully in about a month or so's time before we launch these benefits, but um, more of that another time. But everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much again to Brian um, for another lecture with us today. And um, I hope everyone has a great weekend and um, we look forward to seeing you at another future lunchtime lecture from us at the Church Conservation Trust. Take care, everyone.